Praise the Lord and good Sunday morning to you all. Thank you so much for uh, those of you who are already tuning in and have been with us through our praise and worship time. It's good to have you back on a, a Sunday morning as we do it here continually uh, through this medium of, of working uh, with our online services. And uh, this will continue on for a few more weeks. Uh, I'm kind of looking at uh, sometime, hopefully, maybe in August, as, as things continue to move along, as things continue, numbers get better. Uh, but also, as I told you the last few weeks, we are we have started the renovations. The renovations are going on well. We had to uh, slow things down for a week or so there just after uh, uh, we had the few people on our staff that uh, had tested positive for the virus. But everybody's doing great. Everybody's moving forward. At least another one or two of our church members have also uh, had, uh, had the virus, been tested positive but they're doing great. Uh, a couple of them went to the hospital a day or two, but then they've been released and they're doing quarantines uh, now, but uh, doing doing good. So thank the Lord for that. And if you've uh, been going through this and I don't know about it, please let us know. We want to keep you in our, uh, make sure we're praying for you. We pray for you all uh, as, a, as a, a group, but uh, if we have specific prayer requests, we need to know those requests. And you can let us know on my um, uh, on my telephone numbers and they'll come up on here uh, periodically uh, through uh, that same number numbers uh, for SMS or you can look on, look for me on WhatsApp with that same number or also just uh, leave messages right here on this this forum as well on the uh uh, if you're on Facebook, do Facebook. If you're on YouTube, leave a message on YouTube. Somebody's checking those messages. Hopefully, I try to do it every week, but I hope some of my other guys are checking as well just to make sure we don't miss some messages that come through there. But do that for us. And we just, we're so thankful. Uh, the church is looking good. Uh, the changes we made, uh, most of the construction aspect of it has been completed. A few, few uh, uh, minor things that need to still be done, but uh, this week they'll be working on running electrical wiring and uh, we'll start... Uh, start painting with the new fresh paint colors that we have uh, so it's, it's going to be nice we're looking forward to that so just keep praying uh, for that and and, and if you have any, any of you uh, uh First and foremost, let me thank you all for the way you're giving and the way you're continuing to bless the church financially. Uh, you know, our church operates a little differently than most churches. Uh, myself or Sharon, we don't take any kind of a salary from our church uh, at all. We, we, we get our support through our mission. Uh, we raise our support personally to do that. Uh, and in order to be here in Kenya to work the way we work, we can't do that anyway. And we, we, we don't desire to. So, uh, But all of our funds that come in, they go to just help the ministry and help people. And, and you know all about that. That those of you who attend with us, those of you who have joined us online, maybe you don't know that, but that's how we operate. And everything you give just goes right into ministry. Uh, but if you would like to help, give something specific to help with the uh, uh, remodeling, uh, as, it, as in all remodeling construction projects, it is costing more than we originally thought because as you get into it, you, you realize there's more things you need to do than you thought you had to do to start with. Uh, but uh, we, we're going to come pretty close, I think, what we were hoping for and what we were looking for in that. That. But if you'd like to help us in that area above and beyond whatever you give us through your tithe and offerings, uh, please do that. And you can give it right through the same channels, through the same directions that you have been given. And we appreciate that. And I want you to know we're continually helping people to uh, get food. Um, uh, we're feeding uh, just numbers and numbers of people every week. About every two weeks or so, I'm having to replenish. And, and I mean, when we, when, we, when we buy, we don't just go and buy a few bags of, of ugali and a few bags of of beans or rice we, we go by bulk and we buy bulk packages so about every two weeks we're having to replenish that stock just to help our people and then there's other people that we hear about that we try to help and we're doing that all because you're helping us with that and uh, very little money so far has had to come right from our operating budgets and funds most of it are just people like you that, that send two thousand and five thousand and seven thousand and three thousand uh, to me and usually I ask send that directly to me but you can put it through the bank account as well Either way, it's fine, uh, and uh, there'll be things on the bottom of the screen telling you how to do all that as well. Okay, so God bless you. Also, let me say thank you for all the birthday wishes and birthday greetings. Yesterday was my birthday. I uh, just, just turned 59 years old, uh, so thank the Lord for that, uh, and I just give Him the praise and the glory for everything He's done for me and what He continues to do for me in my life, and thank you for being so special to me, those of you as a part of our church here in ministry in, um, in Kenya and East Africa, but even those that uh, are connected with us all 
all around the world. We thank you so much for that. Eh? And the Lord bless you. The Lord be with you. The Lord watch over you. Well, let's get right into our, our, our messages today. And before we do that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord's blessings to be with us, to be on us today. And we'll pray for your specific needs as well as we do this time of prayer. Let's go to the God. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for this very, very special time to be together with our brothers and sisters uh, here through this medium of, of online church, God, that we've been f focusing on now for the last almost four months, I guess it has been, Lord. But we still see and sense and know that you are with us and that you are uh, still a part of this. And we, we know that you're doing something special and great in our lives, in the life of our church, in this world. And even though we know the enemy might have another plan for all of this uh, COVID-19 and all of the, the governments that are making real drastic standards and real drastic changes towards churches and things like that, we know that God has all always had a people. God will always have a people and there's no way to stop them. There's no way to bottle them up. There's no way to keep the word of God from going forth and from being productive in the lives of people. And so we're just, we'll do what we have to do for now, but we won't stop preaching. We won't stop meeting needs. We won't stop giving Jesus out to people who need Jesus. And we will continue to do that and even do it more, God. We want to pray for all of our brothers and sisters today who are in specific needs of prayer. Continue to touch Jeffrey and Sylvia in their home as they're recovering from the COVID. Uh, continue to minister to Dr. Laura as she's uh, recovering from the COVID. Uh, maybe some others, Father, that I don't even know about or I'm not remembering right now. Others have had other issues uh, physically in their lives. We pray for them. Uh, many are facing financial struggles, God, and we just pray that the God who blesses, the God who is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, that you will continue to be a provider for your people through this time. Bless us, God. Bless us with every good and perfect gift. Uh, bestow upon us every good and perfect gift that comes from the Father above and help us to not only just be, be uh, consumers of blessing, but Father, help us to be those who take these blessings and who pour them out and who give them out and who take the blessing we have and, and multiply that blessing back into the lives of many, many people. Bless today the message as we take in part two of our of our series on on the times we live and the end times i pray that this word today will be a challenge to us father and that you'll speak to heart specifically and directly today because of the word that will be shared today put me on like a coat and wear me make my tongue a pen of a ready writer that i won't just speak the words of ron and the words ron has prepared but the words i speak will be the words from almighty god and they'll touch and change people's lives and we ask that in jesus name Amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. Let's get your Bibles out. Get your notebooks out. We're going to pick up right where we started last week. We started a series of messages that I titled, We Don't Want to Know What We Don't Know talking about just kind of a play on words about the end time because some people just would rather not talk about it they'd rather not hear about it they'd rather not focus on what's going to happen just kind of put their heads in the sand and say well if it's going to happen it's going to happen I don't have to talk about it but uh, I don't believe that's the way we're supposed to be in the church I believe we're supposed to understand and our scriptures today, uh, the scripture we've used as a text in Second Peter chapter 1, that scripture tells us that, that we, we don't need to be unaware. We don't need to be uh, ignorant, as we talked about last week, the scripture in Thessalonians, uh, that about the things that are coming, because if we believe God, if we trust God, we know that God is still in control of everything. He's still in control of everything that's going to happen. There's nothing that can happen outside of God's control. So we have to understand that, and that's a part of who we are. Now, we see things that do happen. We don't say that God condones everything. We don't say that God is, is, is a part of all the things we see, but there's nothing that is outside of God's control and God's ability and God's power to deal with and take care of. And He, he will have His say. He will, Isaiah says, that there is no God like our God and He will do what He pleases. And we believe that and we know that God has a time plan. He has a, an agenda set that He's working. And that's what we're talking about uh, as we do this and use that play on words. We don't want to know what we don't know. Or, I said in my title, do we? And I believe we do as we talk about these end times. So let's look right in 2 Peter. Let's read that text of Scripture starting in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 16. 
He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love, and I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. And that's Peter, of course, talking about the times that they walked with Jesus. Then look what Peter says. We also, in verse number 19, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you do well to pay attention to it. I emphasized that last week. I'll do it again today. We do well when we pay attention to the prophetic message, to the prophetic words that are given us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And Peter says to this, it is like a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So that's, that's our text scripture, and I hope by the time we finish this series of messages that that'll be a scripture that you know. Maybe you can even start working on memorizing it some in your heart so that as we as people talk about it, and as you're beginning, and, and if you watch YouTube channels, and if you watch Facebook preachers, a lot of preachers are talking about this now, and, and it's not... Um, it's not unusual because of the times we're living in. But we need to realize and understand that God does have a prophetic message. There is a message that people speak and people share. And I'm doing the same thing. Uh, but I, I declare to you, and I've done this many times, but those of you who don't know me, I am not in, in, in any sense of the word declaring that I'm a prophet. There are many things as we get into the things and the, the, the events of the end times, that there, there are things that I will not even endeavor to try to pinpoint or put a name to or put a place to. I have certain beliefs and certain views that I will share with you and are things that our church teaches and believes, but I, I will not give set dates and times. I will not tell you names of who this person is and who that person is because if the Bible doesn't reveal it and the Bible hasn't revealed it, I'm not going to come across and say I know it at this point and I know what that is. But today we're going to really just pick up where we were at last week. Last week we introdu introduced our topic really of trying to just come to a place of, of understanding that the Bible is a reliable source. Uh, the Bible, that all these prophecies that have been declared in the Bible from right at the beginning, we talked about the first one being in Genesis 3, all the way into the book of the Revelation, that these are prophetic words that uh, that are reliable and that the Bible can be relied upon. And I, I spent most of last week sharing that thought and sharing the ideas and giving you just several different uh, uh, just proofs through proving prophetic words and giving the uh, the uh, the prophetic word and when that prophetic word was fulfilled and talking about how the Bible has proved itself over and over again and uh, uh, we're going to con kind of continue in that a little bit today but we're going to bring our focus and move our focus today to uh, the nation of Israel to Abraham and to the nation of Israel specifically uh, today just for a few minutes and. I think I mentioned this maybe last week as we were talking about, because uh, uh, I know I, I, I brought up the scripture in Genesis chapter 12, and you can go ahead and be turning there. But two things we need to understand about biblical prophecies as prophecies are written, and this is, a, this is something in general, I'm not being specific in this, but when we're looking in specifically in general uh, with prophetic, the prophetic in the Bible, the events of the end time recorded, just like most of the other prophetic prophetic words in the Bible are centered and focused on Israel. That doesn't mean that the promises of God and the promises and the prophetic promises and all the other things that are spoken are not applicable to us, but the focus of those prophecies, the focus of those words are on the nation of Israel and the people of Israel and the land. And especially as we come to the end times, most of the things that we center on and most of the things we see, they're focused on the nation of Israel. 
And I, and I say that, and I now I add a second thing to that. Uh, one of the questions I'm asked often uh, is, uh, Pastor Ron, why, why do we not see places like uh, Africa that are, are in the Bible in the end time events? Why don't we see Kenya? Why don't we see South Africa? Why don't we see Zambia? Why don't we see America in the end time events of the Bible? And why don't we see all these other nations? We really don't even see much of Western Europe. We see Eastern Europe some, and we see uh, parts of Asia and much of the Middle East in the Bible. See a little bit of Northern Africa. It talks about, of course, Egypt. talks about Libya. It talks about uh, the Kushite people through Ethiopia and Sudan, uh, those areas. But it doesn't come down into Sub-Saharan Africa at all. And, uh, and one of the main reasons is I believe that we don't see much of Africa, the U.S., or other parts of, of the world is because most of these countries today are very strong Christian nations. Uh, many of the countries in Africa that I've just mentioned are well be well over 50 percent most of them are even up into the 70s and 80 percent that are that are professing people declaring that they're Christians and we do believe and we do teach a rapture even my nation I'm an American and I'm from the U.S. even though we lived here for over 21 years now uh, I, I, I still believe that America is a Christian nation. Now, there's a lot of things happening and going on there as, a, as well as around the world that don't seem to be very Christian. But still, there's this nucleus and there's this, this group of people that are still very committed to Christ and, and, and still is a Christian nation, one of the greatest sending nations still to the world and one of the nations that supports and preaches and proclaims the word. And we believe in the rapture. And, and one of the reasons we believe these countries don't play a part in the end times is because we believe most of the events of the end times take place after the rapture of the church. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. But just imagine, even if today one third of America is uh, is Christian and, and they're they're waking and watching. I hope it's more than that. I want to believe it's more than that? I don't know. I haven't heard numbers lately. Uh, what about of Kenya? If if, if Two-thirds of Kenya, or at least 60% of Kenya, 70% of Zambia, 50% uh, of South Africa, all these places. And then all of a sudden, one day, they're gone. They're just, they're, they're, we're there, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they're gone. They're disappeared. They're no longer here. They're no longer fulfilling their businesses. They're no longer working their jobs. They're no longer renting. They're no longer buying. Just think of the countless millions of people that have pulled out of those economies and pulled out of those nations. Those nations will crumble and fall. They'll still be there. They'll still be moving on. They'll still be, but they've lost their power. They've lost their, their not their identity, but they've lost the strength. So we'll talk about that some as we get on to it. But that's why you don't see a lot about those things in the end times. But today, we're going to focus this discussion and, and talk. go back to what scripture I ended with last week talking about Abraham and the people of Israel. And this is just, we're going to do this hopefully quickly. I've gone about 10 minutes in introducing this here. And we'll just try to get on into this now and, and get the message, uh, get to the message and the teaching so that it will be a blessing to us. Because what I want you to see that as last week we saw the, the validity, the, the accuracy of the Word of God, I want you to see that as God began the nation of Israel and the promises He made to Abraham, those promises have carried on and they will carry on. And because God was faithful in fulfilling the word he spoke to Abraham, God also is faithful to fulfill the promises and the words that he has spoken to his people about the time we're living in and also about the times of the end. Amen. And let's go, so let's go there to Genesis chapter 12, starting with verse number 1. We read this at the end of our message last week and then I left it there. And we'll pick up those first three verses. This is when God first calls Abram, not Abraham at this point. And if I do say Abraham sometimes, just realize I've, I've gone a bit too far. It's Abram. And it says, The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. Verse number two, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Boy, that's a beautiful word to say about somebody. He says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse you. And then this last phrase, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. 
Now that's not only a great blessing to put on somebody, but just imagine if you're the man standing there and God comes in and speaks something like that into your life. Number one, you say, wow, how, can I, how, how could I be uh, so favored that God would speak this to me? And then on the other hand, you say, man, a lot. That puts a lot of pressure on me and that puts a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, just weight on my shoulders of how I'm going to live this out. And, and I wish I had time to just dig into that scripture and take every verse just almost word by word and verse by verse. We don't, have, we don't have time to do that. But I want to continue this thought that we started last week of how God fulfilling His word to Abraham gives us hope that God's prophetic word is God's bond. God's prophetic word is God's title deed to what He's going to do in the future and what He's going to do in your life and in my life, but even more so what God is going to do in the world. And I can't deal with everything, so I'm going to deal with just two things. The first thing God says about Abraham there, this, 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 this man, this, this guy that nobody had heard about before God calls him here, God says, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your name great. Now, all of us who are Christians, who attend this church or other churches and you're watching, uh, all of us would say and we would know that Abraham is one of the main characters of the Christian Bible. He is mentioned in much of the Old Testament. He's mentioned in some of, a good bit of the New Testament as well. He's looked at uh, also, uh, he is the father of the nation of Israel, just as we spoke. It all began with him. But however, in the world's eyes, even though Abraham is very important in the Bible, Abraham in the world's eyes is much more than that. Uh, he may be even more than Christ from a worldly viewpoint. Abraham may be the most well-known biblical character in all of the world history. Uh, he is known as the father of the Jews, uh, and we know that, we've said that, but he also is the father of all uh, the Muslim nations of the world. They look to Abraham as their great father, as their great patriarch. He was the father of Ishmael, uh, that, that uh, child that uh, Abraham uh, had with his, his, the concubine that his wife Sarah brought to him because she hadn't had children. And we know that, that he fathered them. And so both of these two great peoples of the earth look to Abraham not just just as a patriarch the way we do, but they look to him as their father, as the beginning of who they are. And then us as the Christian people, other than the, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Abraham is probably the, the one of, arguably, we can use that word arguably uh, there, one of the most important Bible characters, if not the most important Bible character in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, of almost the, of the 8 billion people on the face of the earth, more than 5 billion people look to Abraham. They know the name Abraham. And when you mention it, you don't have to give a second name. You don't have to give any other preference to him. All you just have to say is when you're talking in form of biblical religious things, when you mention the name Abraham, 5 billion people on the face of the earth know that name. So we can say that when God says, I'm going to make your name great, that God has fulfilled that promise in Abraham. He said, God told him, said, I will make your name great. And what I want to tell you today, and what I see that for me and you in our lives today, when God speaks something into your life, when God declares something over our lives, He is able to overcome every obstacle that may be thrown up in front of us, and He can make His Word come to pass in our life. He can look at a man named Abram and bring him out of this place called the Ur of Chaldees and one day just see something in him, speak something into his life. And when he can make that thing happen and he can cause that to happen, what can he also do in your life? Anything God has ever done seldom begins with all the problems being solved, with all the finances being placed, or with all the questions answered. And we know and even in Abraham's situation, if we follow that story, we know Abraham didn't have every situation uh, dealt with. He didn't have all the answers to everything. But when God spoke to him, he began a walk of faith. He began a walk of faith. And how do we know that? Because God says, I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave everything that you know, and I want you to follow me. And the Bible tells us that Abram gathered that 
gathered up his family. He gathered up his belongings and he began to follow the Lord to a place he did not know, to a land that he did not know, to a people and, and an area that he had no concept of, but he followed the Lord as a step of faith. And following God, following him in this life, whether you're a patriarch of the church or whether just you're sitting in your living room with your family, with your home, with the, the things that God has put in your life, following him always requires a step of faith. It always requires a step of faith. And you'll never do anything for God. And this, I'm kind of taking a sidetrack from the message to give you a message specifically today that God can use you. And if God has spoken something into your life, if God has given you a word, if God has given you a promise, if God has, if God has given you a hope, in order for that word to come to pass, you've got to fulfill the step of faith that God has called you to do. And I can tell you this just from our personal life and mine and Sharon's personal life of, of taking steps of faith and walking out in faith that sometimes you're going to be misunderstood. Sometimes like uh, Abraham, like Noah, other guys of the Bible, sometimes people may laugh at you. And, and there'll be many times that you may even shed some tears and you may even sometimes go to God and say, God, are you sure? God, is this the path? God, am I doing the right thing? But if you'll remain faithful and if you'll keep moving forward, if you'll keep trusting God, if you'll keep walking with God, if you'll keep believing God, if you'll keep moving forward with God, God will fulfill His promise. God will fulfill His word in your life. He will do what He said He would do in you. And we don't know the timetables. We don't know the, the way that God plans everything. Abraham, when he died, he never saw any of what God had promised him. He didn't see all that. The only thing Abraham knew about what God promised him and saw about what God promised him is that he had a son named Isaac. That's all he knew. Isaac hadn't uh, he'd gotten married before he died, but he hadn't had all of his children yet, or, or had his, his, not all of his children, his two children yet. And, and Abraham didn't, didn't see the fulfillment of God's word in his life, but he believed God, he trusted God. And when he died, he had no idea that the impact of himself, of him obeying the voice that called him to leave everything behind and trust God, he had no idea how it not only would affect his family's life, but it would affect the lives of the world. God said, I will make you great and, out, and because of you and through you, every nation, every people of the earth will be blessed because of you. Powerful words. And when God speaks something over, to your over your life, you hold on to that word. You trust that word. It may not even be you. It may be the next generation. Sharon's dad talked about that many times. He knew that God had spoke things into his life that he would never fulfill. But he believed that, that uh, his, his natural family that he had poured into, but also his his, his African family that he had worked with here for almost 50 years before he passed away, that, that the things that he had put in them, that he would see those fulfilled through those people. And that's how God's Word works. He said to Abram, I will make you great. And God fulfilled that promise in Abram. And then the second thing that I'm going to deal with today and uh, as we get into a message, and this is the main point. When he looked at Abram, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abram at the time, or Abraham at the time, was Abram. And, and thankfully, I've been using the proper name most of the message here, uh, was Abram at the time. And when God called him, he and his wife Sarai had no children. Which for that day and time, it was un unusual for, uh, for uh, men in the Old Testament time. We could even say in the old histories of African people, those of us who live here, that, that children are one of those treasures. Even it's still looked upon. People are looked upon here, and I, I think very wrongly, because that's God's plan. That's not a man's thing at all. That the People that don't have children, sometimes other people look down upon them, or they think there's something in their life. We've even had stories of, of, of men that we knew that serving the Lord, walking with the Lord, uh, and their families, uh, they, him, them and their wife, they never could have uh, or have not had children at the time. And people within their tribal groups, people within their home areas would go tell them, you need to, you need to just put that wife aside or, you know, in this culture, there's polygamy is there. So just keep her, but you need to get you another wife so you can have an heir. You can have children through that. And, and, and that mentality of, 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 uh, 
a person that doesn't have children that even sometimes there's a some kind of a curse on them or whatever but I want you to know that's not true that's not true God has everything in control and if God has blessed you with children that's a blessing from the Lord but if God for some reason has not to this point blessed your life blessed your family blessed your home with children and maybe if he's spoken to you and I've got three families right here in our church that I know right now uh, that uh, that well two families and there's another one that's there uh, that God has spoken even through me spoken into their life that there's a child coming or there's God has a way of He's going to bring a child into your family, into your home. Uh, just trust the Lord. You keep trusting that word of the Lord. Abraham and Sarah, we know that they messed up a few times. They tried to assist God a few times. Even one time, Abram came to God in, in uh, Genesis chapter 15 and said, God, can my servant Eleazar, he's the, the head servant in my house, I love him like a son, can he become my heir? Uh, but God said, no, you're not, you're not going to have this. And right there in chapter 15, God says that there's a nation going to come out of you. There's a, a, an heir going to come out of you and you and your wife Sarah are going to have a child. But this, 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 uh, young, this child that comes out of you, he's going to, uh, the people that come out of you are going to suffer great consequences right there in Genesis 15. He tells them right there that they're going to face difficulties. They're going to go in bondages for years. But he said, but they're still going to be a great nation and they're going to be a great people. And, and uh, Abraham and Sarah still tried to circumvent God's plan. Of course, I've already mentioned that uh, along came a son named Ishmael that was the son of, of, of Abraham but, or, or Abram, not the son of Abraham, the son of Abram, but not the son of Sarai, the son of, of, uh, of the uh, Egyptian bond servant that was there and, and they tried to do it but in Genesis 17 God comes to Abram and he makes something different see Abram was before and God looked at him and said Abram you're no longer going to be called Abram but now you will be Abraham Abraham and God put that hath that H in his name and he said your wife will no longer be known as Sarai but she is Sarah and that same hath sound and that's, a, that's a, a, a term in the Hebrew and even it talks about or it gives an idea of the spirit of God the breath of God that has breathed over them now and you see Abram and Sarai could never fulfill the promise of God but Abraham and Sarah would be the ones who would carry God's blessing who would carry God's people in to the promises that God had made and God came to him in Genesis chapter 17 and said now you will have a son and we know that uh, Abraham was 99 years old and the book of uh, Romans tells us that Abraham looked at himself and said God I'm a dead man I don't, I don't function anymore as a man how can I have a child and God says the word of God is in your life the promise of God is in in your life you trust God and God will make you and give you all that you need to be able to do what I've called you to do and brothers and sisters some of us may be here today and we have that word of God in our lives and we have that call of God in our lives and we think God wants to use us we know God has spoke to us but we don't see how it can happen we look at ourselves and we say we're dead we don't have the ability to make this work God says it's not about you Abram and Sarah can't do it, but Abraham and Sarah, with the power and the breath of God breathing into their life, they are able and they can make it happen. And that Abram and Sarai uh, go from one son, and that one son has two sons, and that uh, of those two sons, there's one of them named Jacob and one of them named Esau. Jacob, later on in the Bible, after he goes through much struggle and strife, he becomes known as Israel, and Israel has 12 sons. And those 12 sons become the beginnings of a nation that God says I'm going to make you a great nation I'm going to make you a nation that and, and as God makes that that land and that people of Israel a great nation he says I'm going to be with you and I'm going to use you and everything that centers around the rest of the world everything that centers around the rest of mankind all comes down to the nation of Israel Two things I want to look about today, two specific things about Israel that are very important to us in understanding biblical prophecy. Remember I said last week that from the when, when we're in the book of the Revelation, and it's not revelations, it's one revelation that covers the whole book when God begins to speak uh, 
to uh, John the Revelator. It's a one revelation that God speaks to him from the time he does. But from chapter 4 on through the rest of the chapter, we don't talk about the church anymore. The church is no longer in the picture. The church has been raptured out. Those who are watching. Now that doesn't mean that everybody that has gone to church and that the church does not exist here. But the church, the ones that have been watching, who are waiting, whose, uh, whose lamps are trimmed and burning, if we use that uh, analogy from the Gospels, who have been watching for the Savior, who are ready. They've been taken in the rapture. The church is now out and the, and the remainder of the book of Revelation is focused on, on the land of Israel, on the people of Israel and the enemies of the people of Israel that will come from those areas that the Bible talks about and in a few weeks we'll get to all of those things. But one of the things you, one of the first things you need to see about this land of Israel and this nation of Israel uh, is that Israel, God promised this all the way back there in the beginning. He says they will never cease to exist on the face of the earth. Through the times of history and over the, the thousands and thousands of years uh, that we as Christian people who believe the Bible, who look at the Bible literally and we see the Bible literally, that there was a time of, of creation uh, in the book of Genesis. And when that started, that began a creation. We don't teach evolution. We don't believe evolution. We don't, most, most Christians, most uh, uh, especially conservative uh, believing Christians don't even believe in millions and millions of years that scientists tries to push across us. We look and we see a, a time history of the Bible of, of somewhere between six and 10,000 years at the max uh, for the history of the land. And I know that may some of you, you may say, well, but science says this and, and, and I won't get into that today, but uh, I look at the Bible and I use the Bible and that's not a part of where we are today. But from the time Israel began, and that was really about uh, uh, 4,000 years ago or so when God spoke to Abraham and God put that word in Abraham's life, they have never cease to exist since that time. Only God could make a great nation of Israel. And from the time Isaac was born, they have never ceased to be a viable people on the face of the earth. Listen to what Jeremiah 31 says. The word of the Lord says, this is 31 verse 35 if you're keeping your notes, and I'd love for you to go back and look over these scriptures. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day and declares the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea and so that the waves roar, the Lord Almighty is His name. And listen to what He says here. Only if these these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord. Will Israel ever cease being a nation before me? So the Lord is saying through the prophet Isaiah here that if the moon stops, uh, the sun stops shining and the moon starts appearing and the stars are no longer there and if the seas no longer uh, come in and go out with the tides and things like that, at that point in time, maybe Israel would would cease to exist but as long as those things are happening Israel will never cease to exist then verse 37 he says this is what the Lord says only if the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth below will be could or could be searched will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all that they have done declares the Lord hallelujah hallelujah so Jeremiah prophesied it God had already said it through Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, he, he reaffirmed that over and over through Genesis through through speaking to Abraham then when he spoke to Isaac, then when he spoke to Jacob. He confirmed his word over and over and over again and for that 4,000 years from the time God called him, they have never stopped. They have never ceased. Though persecution or through persecution hundreds of years of bondage, thousands of years of anti-Semitism that still is on the face of the earth today and attempts to completely uh, excuse me, and attempts of complete genocide, Israel and the Jewish people still exist to this day. And from the year 70 AD, when they were defeated again for the second time uh, by the Romans and basically scattered across the face of the earth, they lived, they existed, they multiplied, and they thrived. Listen to this, without a homeland or without an identity. In modern history, Though they make up only less than 1% of the population of the world, they have had more achievements in education, in finance, in politics, in the arts, and in other areas of study and other areas of, of, of just, just things that men accomplish. For the size of the nation that they are, the small little nation that they are, as a people and as a, a, a small geographical site on the land, they have far outweighed 
the other peoples of the earth with the accomplishments that they have. Just listen to some of these names. In technology, I didn't know this till I found it in studying this week. In technology, we know the company Intel. Intel had two men that of, 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 of Jewish heritage, uh, a man named Grove and a man named Vadez. The Google, all of us know Google. Everybody knows Google all over the earth. Uh, two men that are a great part of that, Bryn and Page. Oracle, one of the big computer technology companies. Ellison, one of the top men in Ellison. Uh, was there Microsoft Bomber, one of the big men in, in Microsoft? Not 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 Bill Gates, but Bomber is one of the one of the big men, one of the guys that helped start that that company. He's a Jewish man. Uh, Dale, the man Dale, who Dale Computers and Dale Corporations are named after. He's a Jewish man. Uh, Qualcomm uh, has a man named Jacobs, who is the one of the leaders of that. Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg and Sandberg are both Jewish men in the world of technology, and that list goes on and on and on and on. But what about finance? In the finance, we well, you know names like Gold. Goldman Sachs, Rothschilds, Warburg, Kohlberg, Kravis and Roberts, Wells Fargo, the Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and so many, many more. I read this week, I found out in, some, uh, in a study, a man had written a book. I don't remember the name of the book because I didn't write it down. Uh, he's found out that over 100 Jewish people have received the Pulitzer Prize, been 25 plus Nobel Prize winners among this small group of Jewish people where God says that not only am I going to make you a great nation, but all the peoples of the earth are going to be blessed. And we can rightfully say just from those few names that I've given you right there, through technology, through the sciences, there are also men that have excelled, or men and women, that excelled in the medical fields, in the scientific fields, in so many other areas they've excelled. And they have been a blessing to the entire world because of the, the, the technologies and the inventions and all the things things that they'd done and all the way back when God called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldea says I'm going to make you a great nation and all of the nations of the earth will be blessed and because of all that I've done for you you will never cease to exist and folks just understand please this I'm not I'm not saying all this just to promote the Jewish people today but to affirm what I'm doing is trying to affirm to us that the word of the Lord cannot be stopped the word of the Lord cannot be kept canceled and the word of the Lord cannot be eliminated not over the people of Israel and not over your life as well the word of the Lord is powerful the word of the Lord there's no force like it on the earth and I've got to get this message going if I'm going to finish today let me keep going let me read this beautiful quote I found from a man named J.C. Ryle who is a, a great uh, theologian and, and uh, a preacher of the gospel in some years gone by he said though Israel has been scattered Israel has never been destroyed for 1800 years, this is from the time in AD 70 when they were dispersed by the Romans. For 1800 years, the Jews have continued as a separate people without a king, a land, or territory, but have never been absorbed among the nations. That's what happens to most people when they get dispersed, when they lose their homeland. They, wherever they are, they become absorbed in those people and in those nations. This never happened to Israel. Though they, though they have often been trampled underfoot, but have never Never shaken from their faith or their fathers. They have often been persecuted but never destroyed. At this very moment, they are a distinct and a peculiar people. They are an unanswerable argument in the way of the infidel, a puzzling difficulty in the way of a politician, and an outstanding lesson to the world of the faithfulness of God. Riles goes on to say, many nations Many nations and people have come and gone and have been absorbed by conquering nations, but this has never happened to the Jews. Dispersed as they are, there is a principle of cohesion among them which no circumstances have ever been able to melt. Wherever they are, the Jews always remain the Jews. 3,000 years ago in our Bible, we have recorded where the Moabite people, they call in this uh, this prophet of the days, more of a, of a prophet for hire, more of a, just a, a guy that had some, had some authority and power in the demonic kingdom, in the demonic realms, and they called him in. His name was Balaam, and they wanted him to curse the people of Israel. And Balaam was uh, when the, the, the man who rode the donkey, and you can go read the story about his donkey actually talking to him, and his donkey saving his life. Balaam comes to the point, and he, he's been hired to curse Israel. He's been hired to put curses over their life. He can't do it. And in Numbers 29, verse number Eight, he says, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? 
And then he says this, from the rocky peaks, I stand uh, and I see them from the heights. I view them. I see a people who live apart. They don't live together. And he's, he's even prophesying about that they're going to be scattered. And I see them I do, and they do not even consider themselves among the nations. But then he says in verse 10, who can count? the dust of Jacob, or who can number even one-fourth of Israel. And even Balaam, when he was trying to put a curse on them, trying to help annihilate them and wipe them out for the Moabite people, he can't do it. And all he can do is affirm the word of the Lord on their life. has nothing to do with Israel as much as it has to do with the word of the Lord. And I want you to get that. That's what I'm trying to put in our hearts and our lives today. The Bible tells us that not only can Moab not curse them, but because they tried to destroy God's people. Them, along with the nations of Ammon, the nations of the Philistia, the, the people of Edom, the people of Amalek, all of those nations tried to stop God's plan. They tried to destroy the nations of Israel. They tried to wipe them out. And because they did that, God made a promise in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that those nations would not continue, and not one of them today are in existence. You can't find the people of Ammon. You can't find the people of Edom. There may be people here in these in this country or that country that may can trace their roots back to there, but they're no longer a nation uh, because of the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord said Israel will exist and they exist to this day. And the second thing that we know about Israel, and I have to rush on into this so I can get finished in good time, that God says about them that helps us to see their, their specific purpose in the prophetic and how they're existence makes the prophetic even more viable to us today is God said not only will they always exist there will come a time that they will all be brought back to the homeland or let me say not all but that they will come back to their homeland Jeremiah chapter 29. We know Jeremiah 29 11. If I asked any one of you, uh, even young children, to prophesy, or, or not prophesy, but the, to quote that verse of scripture, uh, most people could do it. Oh, for I know the plans, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Their plans to bless you and prosper you and not to harm you and give you a hope and a future. And we know that scripture well and thank the Lord for it. And I believe it's a scripture for us. Let me. Went my voice there a little bit. We know that scripture well, but verse number 10 of that scriptures, the Lord says to them, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, and what he's talking about, they were taken, the Jews were first taken from their homeland land by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. Jeremiah prophesied this in Jeremiah 29. When the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. So Jeremiah is prophesying uh, to the people of Israel that, yes, we're going into captivity. All the other prophets were saying, oh, it's a time of prosperity. It's a time of blessing. And Jeremiah kept standing up and saying, no, it's not. We're getting ready to be destroyed. Uh, the armies of the Babylonians are coming. These, uh, they're going to come and they're going to destroy us and they're going to take us off and they're going to drag us into captivity. But after 70 years, God says, I'll come back and I'll bring you back to your land. Now, later on, a few chapters later in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah says this. He says, I, the Lord, will bring back my people from Babylonia and everywhere else on the earth. The blind and the lame will be there. Expectant mothers and women about to give birth will come and be a part of the great crowd. He says this, they will weep and pray as I bring them home. I will lead them to streams of water. They will walk on a level road and not stumble. I am the father of Israel, my favorite children. Listen to me, and this is the key. Listen to me, you nations nearby and across the sea. Jeremiah prophesied that they would be taken into Babylonian captivity, but Jeremiah also prophesied that there would also come a captivity where they would be scattered to the, uh, to the, the four corners of the earth. And listen to what he says right here. I scattered the people of Israel, but I will gather them again, and I will protect them like a shepherd Israel guards his sheep. 
All throughout the Old Testament, we're told about the nation of Israel, that they went into captivity, one captivity, but not just one captivity, they went into two captivities. Isaiah 11, 11 indicates that there would be a day when God would raise His hand a second time to gather the children of Israel from their homelands. The first, of course, we just said they would come back to Israel after being in captivity, and then according to Ezra 1, that happened just like it said it would. Then the Jews uh, they came back from Babylonian captivity, but then 500 years after that, they would then be dispersed again. Number one, and mainly because of their hard hearts, because they would not obey the word of the Lord. God had spoken a promise to them, but God could not take their disobedience, and He was constantly trying to put that obedience back into their life. And then we know around A.D. 70, the Romans came in, they conquered, they overthrew Israel, they destroyed the temple. Now this is, they were there when Christ was there, but after Christ had died, after He had gone back to heaven, then they came and they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city, and the Jews were dispersed throughout the land, as, as Jeremiah tells us. And uh, the Jewish people were once again dispersed under the Roman Empire. And after 2,000 years, of being dispersed and and I'll give you a scripture in just a moment that helps us to see that after 2,000 years on the 14th of May 1948 they returned and reestablished their sovereignty in the land of Israel now listen to this this is the key this is a key point of this whole point no other people group in the history of mankind in the history of nations have managed to survive two exiles much less one of those exiles being almost 2,000 years long and then return to establish national sovereignty. It's never happened before, but God spoke it of Israel. He said, I'm going to send you out. I'm going to take you. I'm going to have you dispersed. I'm going to have you taken as prisoner. I'm going to have you taken into bondage because of your disobedience. But rest assured, I'm going to bring you back. The second return was from every nation where they had been dispersed to. Jeremiah chapter 16, Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 31 says that they will not just come back from Babylon but all the nations of the earth. And over the past 120 years or so, more than 3.5 million Jews have integrated or immigrated back to the land of Israel from all over the world. They've come from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the West as a fulfillment of God's Word. Isaiah 43, listen to this text of Scripture. And I'm almost finished. Just stay with me a few more minutes. Isaiah said to the, uh, of the children of Israel, he prophesied this, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east, and I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has said, not only will I send my people out, but I'm going to bring them back to their homeland. And everything we've had, seen happen since 1948, when, uh, when the nations of the world at that time came together and they established Israel and they gave Israel their homeland back, the land that was given to them. And, and there's been a fight over it. They will be continually fighting over it until the end of time. And maybe we'll talk about some of that more and more as the weeks go by. But I just want you to know it's vitally important for us to understand and what we're trying to do here and what I'm trying to help us do. And as we get on into next week, we'll start talking more about the details and more about the timelines and then get into specifics about the rapture and about the Antichrist and about the mark of the beast and about the trumpets and about the seals and about all that. We'll talk about that as much as we can, but without laying this groundwork, I'm just putting things out there that, that don't give you the, the history and understanding. Just about every secular voice in the world, and sadly, even some of the religious voices, just the way they did in the Bible times, want to always portray things as, oh, don't worry, the the end times, it's not really true, it's not happening, there's not going to be a time of judgment, there's not going to be a time God wants to bless you and God wants to prosper you. And we read Jeremiah 29, 11, and we read it and we claim it, but we try to, we take it out of context. There is, we're in a time, we're in a time of testing and trial. Have we entered into the, to the, the end times, the times of the tribulation? No, I don't think we have. And the main reason is because the rapture has not taken place. And, and I do believe that in next, I think I'll get into that next week. At least we'll start it. We'll look at the timelines next week for sure. But 
whatever happens, whatever goes on, this coronavirus, it's just a, it's, some people have said it's kind of just a precursor to what, what's going to be taking place when that time comes. We are seeing lots of things happening. We're seeing governments take more control over their people, more control over how their people move. The thing that scares me the most is how they've taken control over the churches. And there's going to have to come a point in time that the church comes to a point that we say, you know what, this is good and we, we've understand and we've tried to, we've tried to, to, to uh, do what we could to help the people. But we can't allow governments to legislate and governments to set the identity of who we are as a church. And I believe even through this, though we've not been able to meet in our church, I've told you this over and over, I believe that we've become even stronger in exile than if we can use that term and that's not really what it is but it's kind of that way we become even stronger in exile just the way the israelites did every time they went into an exile they came out stronger and they came out uh, with more population they came out with with more wealth they came out with more blessing in their life and i believe god's going to bring the church out that same way through this but as we go through this we have to believe and we have to know that god is with his people he will bless his people he will keep his people he will help us he will heal us he will provide for us he has spoken his word into our life but we do have to realize and know that we are coming into a time that may be the times drawing to the end maybe a time drawing to the end you're already seeing even in, in in our circles right here in kenya and around the world you go to places now you go to restaurants you go to shops and they say oh well, you can't use cash anymore all we'll take is your card or we'll take your impassive one day that's going to come about that there's going to be no cash available. There'll be no cash there. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks when we get into the mark of the beast and all the things that deal with that. But then let me close with this scriptures from Jesus out of the book of Matthew. This is what Jesus said at the close of his time when he was getting ready to start facing, facing his suffering and facing his death. Matthew 24. And if you can turn there with me, you can read. We'll start reading with verse number 3, just kind of about midway through verse number 3. The disciples are talking to Jesus, and they've kind of come off to the side with Jesus. Uh, I think they were on the Mount of Olives, and they came off, and they asked Jesus this question. They said, tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will the sign of your coming what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? So Jesus had already told them that you know, he's going away, but he's coming again. And Jesus answered them. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. Isn't it interesting that the first thing he says, be careful because there's going to be people that try to deceive you. There are going to be people that try to tell you, oh, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. Or people that are going to come in and, and say that, that the Christ is already here, that he's, I've already come back. He said, don't let people deceive you, deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. Jesus says that they will deceive many. So don't say, well, I can't be deceived. I hope you can. And if you know the Word and if you stay close to the Word and if you follow the Spirit of the Lord, I don't believe you can be. But people will be deceived. He said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And Jesus says in verse number 8, All these are the beginnings of birth pains. And all of you women out there who have had children, you understand what that means. It's not necessarily the time for the birth, but it's beginning. And you know things are getting in position. Things are getting ready. Things are going to happen. Then in verse number 9, He says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted. Some of you will be put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And you say, well, that can't happen to me. I hope and pray that it can't happen to any of us. But Jesus said that it will happen to many people. And many false prophets will appear and they will deceive many. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the ones who stand firm to the end will be saved. And then in verse 14, he said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. That's what we're talking about. The times we're living in and the times that are to come. I've tried to, for the last two weeks, give you just some strong 
tried to keep it simple, tried to keep it from being complicated. Biblical proof that, number one, the Bible is the strongest evidence that prophecy has been fulfilled. All the prophecies in the past that could come to pass at this point have, and all those that are made for the future will be completed and fulfilled in the future just the way the ones that have already been fulfilled. And also that at all the promises that God spoke about His people Israel, everything He said about them, He has to this point brought it to pass Many people that talk about prophecy, they say one of the late, last greatest signs when we knew that we were in, in, entering into the time, the, the time when God's plan will begin to fulfill is when they would become a nation again. That happened now 70-something years ago. 72, I guess. I'm trying to figure that in my head. Whatever it is. And everything has been lining up. And now things are beginning to happen. And as everybody says that I listen to, Nothing needs to happen. Not before the second coming, but for the rapture of the church. There's nothing else that needs to happen other than, Jesus, other than God the Father saying, Son, go get your children. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Have you given your life to the Lord? Have you been deceived like some of these Jesus just talked about? That they've listened to the voices of this age and they've listened to the voices and the people are here and they've, they've been deceived and they've been turned in their hearts and their love has grown cold. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let, don't let this time, don't let the things happening in life, don't let the, the heaviness of life, the burdens of life, the troubles of life, Turn you away from God, but let this bring you closer to Him. If you need to get forgiveness in your life, ask forgiveness. If you need to repent again and turn your life over to Jesus again, repent and turn your life over to Christ. The times coming will be hard and they will be tough, but they'll be much harder and much tougher for those who try to go through it without the Lord Jesus. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you for this time of being together today. Thank you for all the signs that you've given us from the time that you began writing scriptures down with Moses recording the books of Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus all the way through to when the revelation was written by the Apostle John as he was on that island of Patmos. Everything you wrote there and everything you had penned by these uh, different writers throughout the histories of time that we talked about last week, they were there, put there for a purpose. They were put there to help us, to teach us, to help us, to, to show us not only that you have a plan, but that your purpose will come forth. And Father, I just want to speak to those right now that are listening to me, that are watching on this TV screen. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, you can give your life to Christ. Just right there where you sit. And if you're feeling the drawing, if you're feeling something just tugging at your heart right now and you want to give your life to Christ, just simply say right there where you are, Jesus, I ask you today to come into my life and I ask you, forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all of my wicked, my unrighteous, my, my deeds that I do that I don't want to do, I don't desire to do them, but I do them. Cleanse me of all that, God, and give me strength not to be a wretched man, but to be a man after your heart. God, I ask you to come into my life. I confess you right now as Lord of my life. I believe in my heart that Jesus came. He, he, he died, He was buried, and He rose again. And today I accept you, Jesus Christ, as Lord of my life. And today I repent of my sins, and I begin to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. And Father, I just pray over our people. I pray your blessing over their lives, over their families, over their home, and even the people that this goes out to wherever it goes. We don't have any control over that. Only you do, Lord. And I pray that you would bless it wherever it goes, that it would be a blessing to people's lives. And that anything I've said, Father, that I pray that the Holy Spirit would just take it and use it for your glory and for your purposes. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
Amen, amen. God bless you so much. I hope you're enjoying this. Now, as we begin over the next few weeks to get more into this uh, and into the teachings of the things that a lot of you are looking for, if you have some questions, send me those questions. I can't promise you that I can answer them all. Uh, I'll do my best to answer as I get into them and those times and places within the teachings. And I know once I start talking about things, maybe more questions will come. Uh, but uh, send us questions. Make comments. If, you, if any of this blesses you, it, it really... Uh, one of the hardest things this is uh, for pastors and teachers and leaders and preachers or whatever you uh, the, the terminology at that point in time is, is that we don't have the feedback and we don't do what we do for feedback or we shouldn't. But it really does help sometimes to know that your people are out there and they're standing with you and they're being blessed and they're being encouraged. They're being challenged. If you ask Jesus to come into your life, let us know about that. We'll get you connected with one of our, uh, our staff pastors or get you connected with some of our other people in the church that will begin to help discuss disciple you and begin to help you to, to, to grow in this walk with the Lord, okay? God bless you so much. Once again, let me say thank you for your financial support to the church. The numbers for giving are all on the screen here down below. Uh, so just uh, whatever you need through the bank account, you can do right through M-Pesa. You can transfer from your bank to our bank, uh, or ever how you have to do it. If you don't have those accesses and sometimes you just need to go by the church or you want to send it, you can send it to me or send it to one of our other pastors. Just, you know, follow that up with accountabilities so that we keep all of us accountable. We, we want to make sure that you're being blessed at this time. And if you have needs, if you have financial needs, if you have needs of food especially, uh, get in touch with us. There's food at the church. Uh, it should be there all the time. I try to tell them to let me know ahead of time if it's running low. Uh, so we appreciate Brother Paul and uh, Brother Joey Seagan and all the work they've done to keep our food uh, stocks supplied. Uh, go by there and get you what we have. We don't, we don't have everything, but we have some things. And those things we help give you can help you so that you may can go get your vegetables and other things that you can get. God bless you. Uh, other needs you may have, uh, just put them out there. Help us. We'll pray for you with them. If we can't help, we will. Uh, other areas, sometimes we can't help everything that people ask, but we do everything we can. And we'll definitely pray that God will provide for you where we can't come in. We, we know God is able. Amen. We love you. God bless you. God be with you. I greet you on behalf of Sharon. Um, remember Wednesday night, we'll be doing our Wednesday night uh, Bible study. Sharon will be teaching that. And uh, she's been talking about the last few weeks on just how to, how to be a soul winner and getting that re-emphasis in our life of, of sharing the gospel with, of Jesus Christ with those we love. And, and, and she's been doing a great job of just giving some basic principles of how to do that. And, and most of it starts with prayer. So uh, God be with you. We look forward to being with you as soon as we can. I'm shooting for maybe that second Sunday of August if we get all of our renovations done. Maybe we'll try to come back and have a service together then. If not then, at least by the 16th of August, maybe we'll be able to worship together. But we can't call that right now, but that's what we're shooting for. And, and um, hopefully this week, like I said, paint will, will be going up on the walls uh, this week. And uh, some other work that needs to be done. We're, we're going to be doing some kind of uh, new fancy things uh, at the back where the cross was. The cross will still be there, but we're, we're actually doing some accents on those walls to make those walls look uh, just, just real nice and tie into our new carpet uh, colors and the wall colors and things. Hope it's going to be nice. Uh, I believe it will be. And we, uh, what we have now has served us since the mid, mid to late 1990s. Uh, so it's, it's, it's done well. So it's time for us to do a, a remodel. And we hope this, what we're doing now, will serve us for another 30 years plus. So God bless you. God be with you. God help you. God keep you. And, and God just be with you. We love you in the love of the Lord. Bye-bye.